debate. Roland Martin takes on far-right-wing conservative commentator, author, filmmaker, and provocateur Dinesh D'Souza. Dinesh D'Souza, glad to have you here. I want to start this way. Politico had a story this week, uh, and this is what they said in their story. Quote, meanwhile, the white vote is increasingly coalescing around the Republican Party in the Trump era, leading to a racially divided political system. Florida's Democratic Party is now majority non-white, while the Republican Party of Florida, compared with Florida's general population demographics, is disproportionately white. The racial realignment of the parties may be disadvantaging the Democratic Party, which increasingly relies on voters with low turnout rates, while the most reliable voting demographic turns towards the GOP. Republicans often talk about party of Lincoln, talk about what took place with the Voting Rights Act and the Civil Rights Act, yet the Republican Party today has a problem with black people. And, and getting them to vote for them, but even appealing to them. I agree. Uh, I think that's unfortunate. I think it's, it is unfortunate that the racial polarization in the country is reflected in the racial polarization between the parties. Now, uh, this does in no way prove that the Republicans have departed from the principles of Lincoln. Remember, Lincoln also got the white vote. In other words, uh, Lincoln was accused of being the white man's president. Well, uh, first of all, black people couldn't vote, so obviously he got the white vote. Well, black people could vote in the North. <laughs> Well, a few could, but my yeah. point is, overall, he, he look, if you were running for president of the United States, you're going to have to depend upon a white vote to win. That's absolutely right. But I mean, Frederick Douglass at one point said mm -hmm. Lincoln was the white man's president. So what I'm getting at is this. You know, I think there has been an unfortunate... The question is, what is causing this polarization? I don't think it's all Trump. You have to admit that the polarization goes much earlier. Oh, no, no, no. The polarization actually goes back to August of 1619. I mean, well, the, the, in that sense, yes. I mean, so the, the reality is we've been... That has been the country that we've been... The issue has been a Republican Party that played a critical role in, yes, for first of all, for so long, being able to get black votes, 
uh, and and that was a that was a uh, and, and again if you were if you were black you didn't even think about the Democratic Party but the party has at, essentially uh, walked away from black folks since '64 that's where it really started that split well let's explore this a little further let's start with the white vote you would agree that. Uh, FDR won the white vote, right? FD, the working class white vote went for the Democrats in the right. 30s and, and, and 40s. Again, same thing. Okay. First of all, so, first of all, prior to any, anything before the Voting Rights Act is the white vote because for the most part, black people were still disenfranchised across the country. No, no, here's my point. It's not white versus black. It is that working class whites were Democrats rather than Republicans. Would you agree in the, in, in the FDR okay. era? Okay. What I'm saying is that the Democratic Party began to alienate those voters, not just on cultural or racial issues, but also economically. It, it allowed globalization to wipe away their jobs and paid very little attention to, to that important demographic change. So here's what I'm getting at. Trump was shrewd enough to recognize this and appeal to those voters, but his appeal wasn't a racial appeal. His appeal was a jobs appeal. So if, if people, if working class guys who used to identify with the Democratic Party because their jobs were secure through unions, now identify because they think Trump cares more about them than the Democrats, that's not a racial well, change. Well, he was actually making a racial appeal. So for him, even go back further than that, because if you talk about what took place with unions, uh, you have a Democrat, you had a Republican Party that really went, especially if you look at Ronald Reagan and going forward, was in many ways going after unions in, in different ways. It all depends on what unions we're talking about. Trade unions maintain more of an alliance with Republicans, but because the unions became more service oriented, that's why you saw more black and brown people. And so you had a split. Republicans love police unions. They don't like other types of unions. So it depends, well, on, it depends upon the kind of union we're talking about that, 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 that appeals to the Republican Party. But in fairness, first of all, Reagan was a union guy from the Screen Actors Guild. Second of all, Republicans are ideologically against the idea of the kind of government protections that unions demand. That's an ideological point. It's not a racial point. Uh, Republicans are happy to enforce that point neutrally, whether it's a whether it's a white, predominantly white union or predominantly black union. So you can't take conservatives and take our ideological position like small government and accuse those of being disguised arguments for race because that is consistent with a with an ideology that we apply across the board. Well, there, but there also there are different types of Republicans. If we, if we want to be honest, and different types of conservatives, because there are individuals. I take Texas. For the longest, Texas had for everybody who was elected in Texas statewide. They were Democrats. That was a that was a different type of conservative. Uh, but there's a difference between folks, folks who have been democratically conservative and Republicans who have been conservative. One of the issues that we still also within the Republican Party, you have different Republicans. You have those who are who some call. Uh, national security Republicans, other call economic Republicans, uh, others who call social conservatives, uh, and then you have those who might call themselves, you know, as being moderate. The issue to me today, but, see, but look at all the you named four categories, and none of those categories are predominantly racial at all. So let's take the national security guys. They're against ISIS. They want a strong America. They're not against Muslims. They would be against Russians if the Russians did the same thing that ISIS did. Second of all, the economic conservatives are all about small government. The social conservatives came mainly about issues like abortion. So what I'm getting at is you see a party that's not defined racially, but nevertheless has a constant effort to pin the racial tail on the Republican donkey, but it, even but, though that's not what motivates but, us. But, but here's the piece, but, but, but it is there. I mean, the fact of the matter is, I'll give you a perfect example. Uh, when uh, I at the show Washington Watch on TV One, we offered blanket invitation to any member of the Republican conference to come on the show. Anyone, at any time, virtually no response. And in fact, they, will call, they called Sean Connor, who was an African-American at the RNC, hey, um, what do you think? And Sean said, y'all should go on the show. If you want an opportunity to talk to black people, this is the only television show uh, that's a Sunday morning news show. Wouldn't do it. Tom Price came on, Pete Olsen came on, uh, Tom Price came on twice, Olsen came on, uh, when Alan West came on. Alan, I told Alan West the same thing. Alan West said, told his press secretary, he said, send an email right down to every press secretary in the Republican co conference, and they should come to Roland Martin's show. He said uh, he would give them a fair hearing, an opportunity for them to talk about these issues. No response. And I keep saying to Republicans, you can't go on one hand, why are black folks voting Democrat when you have Republicans who make no effort to even go after black people because there's this fear of what are the issues that are going to come up? There, the Republicans, look, uh, and I think Trump is in a category, in a different category here, but generally Republicans are 
scared of the race issue. And they're scared that they will be accused of racism and they will not know how to respond. There's a how, about, of, how about you respond based upon issues? I, I couldn't you, agree more. You base, but, but, but part of this part of it being scared is because they have to deal with the realities also of policy. So, for instance, I every, on this show, we talk about the issue of voter suppression constantly. Republicans come, oh, no, it doesn't exist. And I'm going, we're looking at it. When I bring up North Carolina, when the federal court said there was a laser-like targeting of black voters, Colin Powell, when he went to North Carolina, criticized Governor McCrory in his face and saying what you are doing when it comes to voting in this state is wrong and it's not fair to black people. And folks said, okay, whatever the hell, we don't listen to Colin Powell. He was a Republican, a black Republican trying to tell them that. And I'm telling you right now, for black people, Trump can run around and talk about jobs all day. He can talk about all the other different issues. But for black people, there's nothing more fundamental than when efforts are put in place to deny them the opportunity to vote. Look, here's what, here, here's what I was getting at when I said that Republicans have this kind of fear. Uh, uh, just a few days ago, I spoke on a college campus, and somebody asked me a question about LBJ, and they were asking me about LBJ's supposed conversion from being a racist Democrat to a morally enlightened progressive. And I said, in my opinion, this conversion was highly suspect because there was very strong evidence that well into the 60s, in fact, post the 1964 Civil Rights Act, Johnson was regularly using the N-word. And I, I cited Robert Carroll, I cited Doris yeah. Burns Goodwin, I cited Barbara Dalek. Yeah, we got it. Event. Okay, so the moment I said that, there were, uh, on, on, on a number of left-wing websites, Dinesh uses the N-word. And I'm like, I use the N-word. I'm actually accusing uh, LBJ of speaking like that and quoting him and citing the historians who have pointed this out. But see, my point is, if I, now see, I'm, because I'm not a white guy, that attack doesn't stick. But if it was a white guy, he would freeze because it'd be like, oh, I use the N-word, even though he's... So what I'm getting well, at, the, it, it, the it, left it, it, does this kind of hit on you. Even though it's a smear, it's completely unfair, I'm not saying you're doing it, but I'm saying Republicans live in fear that when they're accused of using the N-word and it's some white guy, he doesn't know what to say yeah, because but, he, and his career may be over because of some... This kind, so that's why they say, let's stay away. Well, first, of all, go on well, first, well, first of all, you don't have to even use the N-word. You, you, you can simply say, LBJ, use the N-word. You don't have to actually use the word. I mean, so first of all, if you're white, you can, all you have to say is, folks, here's evidence where LBJ used the N-word. Nobody's going to get mad because you said the N-word. You're probably going to get a little bit mad if you actually use the word. But here's the issue even with that. Even with that, I, Republicans bring that up. But there's, there's no denying where LBJ, LBJ was on driving through those policies, how they're going to impact black people. Of course, now, the argument first is... Of all, it's a, it's a whole, first of all, there were a whole bunch of white folks who used the N-word because that was just a common thing for them. But I can still look at when, if you look at, uh, again, Civil Rights Act, Voting Rights Act, Fair Housing Act, there was no other, there was no greater politician during that period who said, we're going to make this thing happen, even over the objections of his fellow Southern Democrats. Well, LBJ made a calculation that the, dem that the demographics were changing, that there was a great black migration, blacks were voting in much greater numbers. Also, the, the white vote was already moving toward the Republican Party in the 50s. In any event, I'm not disagreeing that LBJ pushed the Civil Rights Act. I, I'm questioning what his motivation was. I think it was tactical. I think he was looking at the long-term interests but, of the but, Democratic but, Party. But Abraham and, Lincoln was tactical. Of course I mean, was. you have evidence. I mean, Abraham Lincoln literally said, if I could save the Union, if I could save the Union and slavery exists, fine. If I could save the Union and then get rid of slavery, fine. My goal is to save, save the Union. There's documented evidence of LBJ's feelings about black people, about slaves. And so there's always that motivation for a politician to steal the question is the end result of what they did. The reality is with all the motivation of Lincoln, which of course Lee, Lerone Bennett laid out in his book Before the Mayflower and all those different issues about Lincoln, the reality is Lincoln still signed the Emancipation Proclamation, which freed the free slaves in the territories that were involved in the Civil War. And then you had to still battle after that. And so you still had that issue. Same with LBJ. But the problem that I still see is this here from a Republican Party. When I use well, the they're, phrase, they're, they're scared of black people, I'm telling you, black Republicans who I've known all my life, 
It drives them crazy when their own party, they won't even listen to them. And they're, they're, and they're sitting here going, guys, you will never get black people to listen to you if you're afraid to even walk into the room and sit and talk with them. All right, folks, back to our Roland Martin Unfiltered video in just one moment. Now, a word from one of our Roland Martin Unfiltered partners. You've heard me say it before, and I will say it again. Write down this website, marijuanastock.org. That's marijuanastock.org. I'm going to tell you why it matters. Legal marijuana has grown to become a $9 billion industry in roughly six years. Forbes magazine predicts the market will continue to grow to nearly $50 billion in the next 10 years. So whether you like it or not, legal marijuana is a growing industry and it is only going to get bigger. Now, if you're an investor, you get it. You look for business models that are easy to understand and industries that are trending up. Our friends at Transatlantic Real Estate made their business very simple. They buy land that supports legal marijuana operations and lease it to high paying tenants. So you are investing in the landlord of a licensed marijuana farm. Stop working so hard for your money. Let your money start working for you by investing in the legal cannabis industry. You can invest as little as $300 up to $10,000, but you can't wait. This crowdfunding opportunity is only available for a few more days. They say that you either make things happen, watch things happen, or sit around wondering what happened. Don't be the person watching and wondering. Don't let another investment boom get away from you. It's time to make something happen for you, your finances, and your family. And don't forget my pro tip, to be included, you must complete and confirm your application and be sure to complete the process. Go to MarijuanaStock.org, that's MarijuanaStock.org. Get in the game, folks. Do it now before time runs out. Now back to your Roland Martin Unfiltered video. Well, here's a, here's a profound exception to your rule and that you may be surprised to hear is Trump. I mean, I don't know if Rasmussen is correct in saying that Trump's support among African Americans is 40 percent. Let's say that they, they're overcounting. Let's say it's 30 percent. It's Republicans normally have trouble, as you know, getting 10 percent. So a 30 percent would suggest that here you have a guy who doesn't have that fear. And here you have a guy who well, actually does have the fear. I don't think he does. Actually, he does. I've been at the table with him twice. You look at all the rallies he does. You're not seeing him doing rallies where there are black people. He won't see. He won't. No, this is a fact. And I've been trying for since he got, he won't sit down with black media. He won't do any of those interviews. Uh, and you would think someone who's constantly touting in rallies uh, how he's doing great uh, for the blacks, he would actually have the conversation. He won't. He has these very well, he did have the, he had the Black Leadership Summit of young people. That was interesting. I mean, you had you had a bunch of guys, three or four hundred young people. Okay. How often uh, do you see okay. young people chanting for Trump and okay. chanting okay. USA? Okay. Okay. Did first, you cover that? First, first, Dinesh, yes, I was there. Okay. I was there. It covered it. But also, guess what? Turning Point USA denied black media credentials to actually cover it. Why did they do they, that? Why don't you ask them? I got a letter from them where they approved Jackie Clark as my booker. They approved us. No, Stephanie Eldridge. She, she, so they approved us having the credential. Then he sent an email. Oh, my bad. I'm sorry, you're not approved to cover it, and which is also, but that, but which is also part of their game because that's what I'm talking about. When I, when Candace Owens and Charlie Kirk are running around out there, they're not talking to black people. Okay, she doesn't want to come talk to black people. She's out there, and I know that game. I've seen that game. When if you're going on Fox News to talk to black people, that's the one network that has the smallest black viewership on all the cable networks. You're not trying to talk to black people. Donald Trump as well doesn't want to have those conversations. I sat, I, I've sat there twice uh, in the White House uh, as a part of the anchors asking him questions. And this is, these are the issues. What they want to do is, and this is the problem for Republicans, for white Republicans, they want to have conversations with black people on their terms. Well, I don't not think, the terms of the I, people. I'm not sure if that's it, because let's look at it this way. I do think that there is a group. Let's just take, for example, the Black Caucus, which has a vested stake in the Democratic Party, and its agenda mirrors the Democratic Party's agenda from A to Z. So, but first of all, the Black Caucus is the largest caucus in the House among House Democrats. I'm not. I'm, and I'm, yeah, I mean, and I'm, I'm not denying it's a yeah. legitimate caucus. I'm simply saying that. 
you can see why a Republican who sees that those guys are dug in in one camp are going to say, listen, if we want to talk to, uh, to African Americans, we don't necessarily want to do it through the channel of the Democratic Party. So the bottom line of it is, I don't see so who any are you going to talk to? Well, is, is there any reason Trump can't go to Detroit or Chicago or There's Oakland? no reason, but he won't Except, do it. Why won't he do it? Well, that's, you need to ask him. Uh, maybe. No, you know, he literally, I think he should do it. But, but he won't do it. He won't, and that's, but it's not just him. I can I can go across numerous Let me numerous. Ask you this. I, okay. I give you that. Oh, in tech, I'm born and raised in Texas. Okay. okay, I'm still registered to vote in Texas. Ted Cruz sent out a video, sent out an email, uh, excuse me, a tweet where he was critical of Beto O'Rourke some statements that he made uh, about uh, police uh, brutality when he was speaking at a black church. There, Ted Cruz has absolutely no video of him even visiting a black church. Okay, he won't, that that wasn't even even consideration. And I keep making the point to Republicans. I can show you. Here's the proof of Republicans who made an effort to, one, respect black people, talk to black people, and work with black people. George Vinovich. George Vinovich was the mayor of Cleveland. While he was the mayor, he wasn't scared of black people. They actually were at the table, and he worked with them. He got 40% of the black vote when he ran for the United States Senate. And then, excuse me, when he, ran, when he ran for governor, significant black support, significant black support when he ran for U.S. Senate. Why? Because George Vanovich wasn't scared of black people. He actually sat down, talked to him, worked with him. That's the difference. The reason there's this schism between Republican Party and black people is that white Republicans across the board some for, do not want to engage black people on issues that they care about. They want to say, hey, here are two issues that we, that, that, that we got, and that's good enough. Well, now, there is another side to this that is a little bit firm but needs to be brought up, and that is that it is always a danger for any group to put all its eggs in one basket. So, for example, let's take the African- Who's that? The African-American vote. If the African-American vote is 90% in the Democratic bag, right? A Republican's going to say, look, I'm only competing for 9 or 10%. Maybe I can push it up to 12. Hold, but right hold on. But, but, ask, but, see, but ask why. I agree. Right. Uh, but ask why 90%. This is very simple. Okay? And I'll just, so this is, this is, this, I'm going to just use an example that all of us can understand. You and I in high school, there's a woman, we want to ask her to go to the prom. You don't even talk to her. You don't even look at her. You don't even wave at her. But I do. Oh, your example doesn't work. No, here's the deal. It, if it, you don't even make the attempt, you're never going to get somebody. Right. If you don't if you don't even say hello to them, okay. if you don't if you don't even meet with them, guess and black people are smart enough to go, "Wait a minute. If you don't even come by, if you don't even talk to me, you yeah. don't even engage me, you're never going to get that person's vote because you don't exist to them. I know, but that, that, that mistakes the cause and the effect. Let me explain what I'm talking about. The I'm, black I've vote, only seen on. them my whole life. Right, but you're acting as if, as if blacks aren't voting for Republicans because Republicans aren't courting them more. There's a grain of truth in that, but the deeper thing is this. The black vote moved from the Republican Party, where it had been for 40 years, going back to Lincoln's days. It moved, be, hold on. Longer than that. I mean, yeah. I mean, I'm t I mean, it moved to the Democratic Party in the 30s. Well, well you know, it was moving there. It, and, well, and, and, and that also was because of Herbert Hoover and the Lily White movement in 1928 right. when you had white Republicans who were lining with Southern Democrats with that Lily White movement. But even then, even in 1928, Ida B. Wells was still campaigning on behalf of Herbert absolutely. Hoover and Claude Barnett was saying, wait a minute, what's going on here? Of course, FDR well, comes in, but, but even Eisenhower got a significant percentage of the black vote. As did Nixon. Same thing. But so so we so when you say the numbers, basically Republicans where Democrats are today with the black vote, that's where Republicans used to be. Correct. And and what I'm saying is that the bulk of that shift, about two thirds of it, occurred in the 30s. See, um, uh, Herbert Hoover got two thirds of the black vote in 32. But FDR got two thirds in '36. So that shift was not because of race. That shift was really because of the New Deal. It was a combination. Uh, okay, but I'm trying to get you to understand today. It was a combination of both, because there were nu numerous black leaders. Who would were you deny? Off. But would you deny in the '30s the Democratic Party was the party of segregation and the Ku Klux Klan? Of course it was. But there guess what? White America was racist. America was racist. The reality is, after the Civil War, the Great Compromise of 1877, black Democrats called out the Republican Party for agreeing to the Great Compromise of 1877. Black, Demo black Republicans said, y'all sold us out. 
And so Republicans agreed to that compromise, which put in place Jim Crow. But they still were able to get black votes. The issue that the issue, this is still the issue today. So perfect example. I hear Republicans talk about 64 Civil Rights Act, 65 Voting Rights Act. Supreme Court gut section for Shelby V. Holder. Sinson Brenner, Republican, Wisconsin, has a bill, says, you know what, we need to address this. Republicans won't touch it. Uh, Goodlatte w- wouldn't even have a committee hearing. These are all Republicans, okay? So when Republicans start talking about party of Lincoln and look what we did with the Voting Rights Act, well, why won't you do anything about the Voting Rights Act today? Why won't you even have a hearing? Why won't you even well, address it? Because, because there's a lot of, it's like the immigration debate. The reason that, uh, look, you, you're asking a different question. Why has there been a breakdown of the traditional types of compromise that parties can make? So, for example. No, that wasn't the question oh, I oh, asked. No, 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 no. That was the question but, I asked. That's the correct question. I'll tell you why. No, no, because, the, que- the question I asked was, if the Republicans tout Lincoln and tout their support for the 65 Voting Rights Act, why won't Republicans today deal with the Voting Rights Act in Section 4 being gutted in Shelby v. Holder? Because, partly because the Republicans suspect that the Democrats' complaint about issues like voter ID and so on are a ruse for letting illegals vote. That's and nonsense. Allowing, hold, no, no, it's not nonsense. It's nonsense, it's, Dinesh. If it's, not, if it's nonsense, why don't you address it? Dinesh, it's nonsense. If it's, if it's not an issue. I have, I have Dinesh. Is, is it difficult? Here, no, here's what it is. There is how difficult there is, is it to do- get an There ID. is document. First of all, how hard okay, is hold it? on. Let me walk you through it. Okay. This is what happened in Pennsylvania. Okay. The head of the Republican Party in Pennsylvania in 2012 stood up and said, Mitt Romney is going to win Pennsylvania because of voter ID. That's what he said. Here's, here, here are the games Republicans play. In Pennsylvania, they said, okay, um, if you don't have an ID, you can get a free ID. But you need to come into the office, sign the affidavit stating that and then we'll notify you about the ID. The person goes back home. You had to come back in and physically pick up your ID. They broke down the study of how many people who were elderly, one, how that going back and forth on a couple of occasions ain't the easiest thing in the world, and how difficult that was. Not only that, in, in other places, they then said, oh, if I want to get my birth certificate right now, I can go to the Harris County Bureau of Vital Statistics to get a paper to get a birth certificate. This is a certificate that shows when Roland Martin was born in the hospital. Republicans said, no, 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 no. You need to get the one with the raised seal. Now, even though this is an official state document, they then said, no, 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 have the raised seal. You had some folks who were married 50, 60 years ago. Ah, you got to have your marriage certificate. That, that, that were very specific attempts. So when you say how hard is getting an ID, that's not the issue. It's how hard do you make it? to get an ID. Right, but remember, Roland, IDs are used in American society for innumerable things. But a lot of people also don't use an ID. Right, but all these magical difficulties don't appear. Here's my point. We need IDs for, you know, when we travel, we need IDs for your children to get certain Actually, Actually, you don't need an ID when you travel because I've actually traveled and forgot my driver's license and there are other methods that they actually go through where you can still travel. But go ahead. Well, the point I'm trying to make is, is that it is important to make sure that the people who vote are eligible to vote, right? And that's a fundamental point. Yes. Because otherwise, otherwise, other people cancel out your vote and my vote who shouldn't be voting. But Dinesh, right? the Dinesh, uh, the, the, first of all, the reason that... So you're th- giving that, the anecdotal evidence of no, I'm not. Pennsylvania, no, I'm not. No, I'm they not. want the raise No, 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 no. Well, I'm get- saying we should, once we agree on the ID principle, I think we can come up with ways to make sure that, that there's a this reasonable is the enforcement of that principle. This is the issue. As long as you have Republicans who are systematically creating ways to limit folks from voting, that's the problem. You have a a situation in Texas. In Texas, nearly a million folks were disenfranchised because of Texas voter ID law. Five federal judges said discriminatory intent. Five. Okay. My home state, North Carolina, the federal judges looked and said they have the emails where Republicans in North Carolina said... Give me the information when black people are voting early in North Carolina. Got it to them. They said 70% of black folks are voting in the first week. Okay, we're going to limit early voting locations in the first week to just one early voting location. They literally devise methods to deny folks from voting to make it harder. We, We know in Wisconsin, when the voter ID in 2016 was approved by the Obama Department of Justice, a federal judge 
called in Governor Scott Walker's office and said, why are y'all dragging your feet on the issuing of voter IDs? So even though there was a voter ID that was approved, then they were, they were slow in getting it out. And the federal judge said, what the hell is going on? Studies show that upwards of 200,000 people, not just black people, but elderly white folks, were impacted by them dragging their feet on voter ID. The point is this here, if Repub and I'm telling you, the one fundamental issue that will always get in the way of black folks even listen to the Republican Party is as long as they are putting in place things that are making it harder for folks to vote and is, is precision-like targeting, black folks will say, I'm not going to deal with you. And that's a fact, Dinesh, that even black Republicans are trying to tell their own party, y'all need to stop this. This is not making our job easy. You're, uh, frankly, Roland, you are raising an issue that I'm not fully knowledgeable about. And so I'm, I'm trying to be sympathetic. Dude, and I'm, I've lived I, and it. And I'm trying to think out loud. But I will say this. I've lived it. Yeah, I will say this. I think that the issues you're raising are quite legitimate. But I will say this. I think that where Trump needs to go is he needs to offer genuine ladders of opportunity where there is Democrat-created dependency. In other words, like, it, it, what does that mean? Well, here's what that means. That means that what's you, Democrat dependency? Democratic dependency is that you have whole areas of this country in which there is a lack of jobs. There's a bad, there's terrible education. There's a lack of opportunity. Okay, and so, hold, on, right hold there. on. True hold or false? Why is that? Why is that? That is basically because the Democratic Party has created a system, essentially a culture. Remember, these are one-party states. A lot of these inner cities, not to mention the Latino barrios, not to mention. Native American reservations, they harvest 90% of the vote for the Democratic Party. So the Democratic Party has these voters where they want them. You have to admit that if these places were transformed, if there was entrepreneurship, Starbucks, uh, new initiatives, jobs, then these D voters D D go Dinesh, up for grabs. Dinesh, Hold Dinesh, on. Did, did you just completely, literally leave out 399 years? I'm talking about, no, no, I'm talking about, are you telling me that, are you telling me that with trillions of dollars being spent on Oakland, uh, St. Louis, Detroit, that there is no way to produce better results than we've seen? So, these okay, are places okay, that are as lot, badly off as they okay, are since 1968. But see, but see, but see this is, it's not, it's no, not no, 1699. No, 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 this is, this is the mistake, again, that you're making, that you can't, that you're not looking at. First and foremost, if you go from August of 1619 to 245 years of slavery and 10 to 12 years of Reconstruction, and then, of course, Jim Crow comes in 1877, and that thing extends to 1968, let's say 1970, the passage of the Fair Housing Act and all those different things like this. This is 2018. If you use 1970 as your barometer, we're only talking about black folks being technically fully free Americans for 48 years. Next week, November 14th, I'm 50, which means... I was born into an America that I was not technically a fully free American. I have met individuals who were the first African Americans. I met a guy in, uh, at the Treasury Department for an event. He was the first black person to ever work at a bank in the entire state of Louisiana. He's hired in 68. The first wave of African Americans hired in Wall Street, 1971-72. What I'm talking about here is we have had we have had a nation that has frozen folks out of economic opportunities for centuries, and then what then is happens is people go, oh my goodness, what happens? You talk about you talk about wealth creation, you talk about all of that. The reality is the highest point of black home ownership ever was 60.4 percent. We saw it during, of course, of the recession beginning in 2007. 53% of black wealth wiped out. When you look at these cities, what people don't want to say is, okay, what created these cities? How did redlining create these cities? How did uh, impact inter impacting folks and compacting them in districts uh, uh, create uh, these sort of pockets? See, that's the deal. Every time Trump talks about Chicago, he doesn't want to deal with the economics of Chicago or the education of Chicago. He only wants to talk about the law enforcement of Chicago. And that's well, the piece that he does it. And I've questioned him at the table. And he doesn't have an answer. Right. But I would say in Chicago, as in these other cities, educational spending has risen astronomically. It has risen by leaps and bounds, and the schools haven't gotten better. And yet I don't see Jesse Jackson out there protesting at the schools, demanding oh, 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 stop, stop, the right. superintendents Dinesh, resign. Dinesh, Dinesh, I don't Dinesh, see efforts Dinesh, to transform Dinesh, the schools. Dinesh, have you been to Chicago? I have. Okay. When you say you don't see it, he's done that. No, Dinesh, but, but Dinesh, he's not. I li Dinesh, I lived in Chicago for six years. I covered it. I ran the Chicago Defender at a radio show on WVON. What you just said is not true. 
I have literally seen it. Jesse, Jesse Jackson is a particular high school in Chicago when one of the schools where he visited, where they had a school pool, no water in it, dilapidated, and where he went to Arnie Duncan and said, how in the hell you got a school that this is dilapidated? This needs to be repaired. He's done that. He's done that. And Which, so, so what you're saying he does hasn't done, he's actually done. No, I'm not saying that. I'm saying that the Democratic Party runs Chicago, right? If they wanted to fix the schools, are you telling me they're incompetent? They don't know how to do it? Oh, I'm, t I'm telling you exactly. First of all, let's deal with Chicago. Harold Washington ran for mayor in 1983, uh, and when he went to the north side of Chicago, he went. He campaigned with Walter Mondale, and their cars were pelted by eggs because white folks in Chicago said, "We don't want you. We, we don't want this black man to be mayor." See, see, see. I, I know all that. No, 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 no. Hold, hold I, this. I think, this. I but this is what you. This is what you're missing out on. So you keep saying Democrats. I keep telling you white. I'm telling you, the issue in Chicago it ain't a question of Democrat and Republican. The issue in Chicago is absolute, undeniable segregation and subjugation of black people. I'm telling you, that's what it is. I, I have sat there and I looked at it and I saw it. This thing goes back from when black folks migrated, reading the Chicago Defender, Robert Abbott encouraging them to come, moving to Chicago. That thing, that wasn't a Democrat thing. That was a white thing. And I'm trying to get you to understand, you keep making this thing Democrat and no, Republican. I, I, I I'm telling you, it's a white thing in America. White supremacy and whiteness has created many of these systems that we have. And what we want to do is we want to act like it's a party thing when it's not. I'm not denying the power of white supremacy. White supremacy was invented in its most virulent form, as you know, by the Democratic Party in the aftermath of the Civil War. Under, and, uh, so it, it was used as a tool uh, and an organizing principle, and the Ku Klux Klan was its military wing. And, okay, and, and, that's who, the and, and, who, and who benefited from it? Everybody who wasn't black. Well, it, it was a form of subjugation and theft. Yeah, right, and, right, 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 precisely. So and what that. I'm saying is, that benefit, if you were white, you benefited from that system. Whether you call yourself a Whig, a Republican, a Democrat, an Independent, or nothing, you benefited now, from it. That's right. American history. All right. Now, pull back a little bit, and, and let me tell you a little bit of history, because one of the advantages of being an immigrant is I come from a different culture, and the world is a wider place. Now, when I left India in the 70s, 1978, India was the begging bowl of the world, right? And I could have pointed to, and would point to, hundreds of years of British colonialism. People had not, they lived in the same place for centuries. There's tribalism, hierarchy. Anything that you describe here was five times worse. Uh, and the level of poverty far more grinding. Now here I am, I go back to visit my family now, and it's 30 years later, and I see people who are going to the, the seashore to wash their clothes, they now have washing machines. And there are people who are walking or going by bullet car to have a car. So what I'm trying to get at is it's not a matter of, and I could, I could go back and talk about hundreds of years of this and hundreds of years of that. The truth of it is if you have good economic policies uh, and they're put into effect, you're going to see transformation. And it doesn't but, take more than 50 years. But Dinesh, it, but within he, a lifetime. But, but Dinesh, this is what I people think. People can improve their lives. But this is also, I think, what you are skipping out on. What we saw, what we saw, and that the King wrote about this in Chaos or Community, where do we go from here? He said the issue for us moving forward is not going to be the person in the clan, in the hood. It's not going to be the person burning a cross. He said it's going to be the moderate white. This is, what he, this is what King wrote in 1967 in that particular book. And what we saw, what we saw in America, we saw, okay, all right, we're cool. So I'm going to use the three Civil Rights Acts. We saw 64 voted Civil Rights Act, 65 Voting Rights Act. But when it came to housing, Republicans and Democrats, well, hold up. Now, now, now y'all going too far because you're trying to live with us. The Fair Housing Act was filibustered. And it was a combination of Democrats and Republicans who filibustered that from 60, all those years. It was broken, finally broken, with Senator Edward Brooke, African-American, Republican of Massachusetts. Right. They broke it in early 1968. It, it was still filibustered in the House by Republicans and Democrats. The only reason the Fair Housing Act was even signed into law is because King gets killed on April 4th, assassinated, murdered. And on April 5th, LBJ sends a letter and said the best way to honor his life is to pass the very bill that he fought for. They were going to still fight that. because So here's what happened. Because you had Democrats and Republicans who were like, look, look, we gave y'all the right to vote. Okay, fine, you can go to hotels. You're not trying to live next to us. 
And that speaks to where America was. And then what then happens? Our neighborhoods is there where you had so much impacted poverty. But you also had where programs were working, but you had the rebel of white middle class voters who say, wait a minute, why is my money going to these poor folks? When it wasn't going to poor black people, it was going to broke white people. I mean, when we talk about how do you transform, I love, Republicans love talking about inner cities and how bad they are. Man, I'm from Texas. I can go show you some broke-ass rural city places that are yeah. filled with white people, and they vote Republican, and they still look the same, and nothing is happening. And so what I'm trying to argue is if you keep making the argument that these programs are about black people in inner cities and Democrats, I'm not saying man, that. I'm telling you, I'm this saying- is, in America, is you broke, you're not broke, but race has been at the core of of so much of our economic policy, our political policy, our social policy, and we can't deny it. And I don't deny it, but I also do think that, I do think that there is a possibility of getting frozen in the past. And here's what I mean. You take a guy today, uh, you know, in the past, the, the, the fun- racism serves a function, and racism is going to be powerful when it's useful to people. So, for example, we all know why racism was powerful under slavery, because it, 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 it sanctioned a system of theft. You work, I eat. Okay, so that's why it worked. Under segregation and Jim Crow, racism was a form of oppression, uh, sharecropping, ways of exploiting the guy at the bottom. Now, what I'm getting at but is... But also still using hold on. police to enforce that as well. Why? Throwing, well, here's what I'm saying. Today, folks, you have a white guy who doesn't folks have a job. In j- throwing folks in Hold jail on. specifically, throwing folks in jail in a peonage system to specifically to provide free labor to those very companies to also grow America, and it was still a free system. All I'm saying is to, you, look at the, you look at the working class white guys who are voting for Trump. What are they getting out of racism? Nothing. Are they exploiting blacks in any way? No. Are they discriminating against them? No. Do they have jobs to give them that they're denying them? No. So, uh, why, so why do they believe it, though? Because they, what, what's, what, why, why do those white men believe that, oh, my God, they're taking our jobs? The, 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 the focus groups data the, show the it. The concerns of the, of the white working class have far more, I think, to do with illegal immigration because there, there is a competition for jobs. You don't deny that a guy coming across the fence who's willing to work for less is an economic challenge to a guy who's living on the margin. Well, so there is there so, is a competition for jobs. So his fear is not irrational in that sense. It's not anti-Mexican. Look, if there were if there were Chinese guys or Indian guys or guys from Ireland across the border and they were swimming across the Rio Grande, you'd have the same concern. So, so why then, when you look at the focus group data, and then when you look at the studies that are done, where you have a racial animosity among those white Trump voters? That exists. The days after the election, Thomas Etzel writes to the New York Times. I see, no, I've seen all that. No, no, but 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 that exists. There there is this 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 whole view. There is this white fear that folks are gripped in. And see, here's what is the mistake that we keep making. And again, I go back to what King wrote. And Bernie Sanders just talked about it. He said, "Well, these people are not necessarily racist, but they were uncomfortable voting for this guy right over here." The issue that we still have is the problem we have in this country. We go. Racist. No, they're not. Not racist. As if racial feelings and perspectives and viewpoints somehow don't inform people's uh, views. I watched Morning Joe during the election. I'll never forget. They were talking, they were talking about, well, you know, with these white men, you know, the wages of white men, working class, white cl- working class men have only gone up 3% since 1972, something along those lines. And for black men, it's gone up 12%. And I'm, I'm tell at home going, well, what the hell were the wages before 73? I'm like, dude, black weight, we were locked out of so many systems. Hell, of course the, the weight annual wages of black people were going to go up. We were completely locked out of a system. Yeah, see, I, people I think- are walking around as if what took place never existed like we all started on the same start line and like well I don't understand why it's increased well, for them and not us I, I see I don't I don't think that's the issue at all here's what I th- I think but it's in the data it's here's the, the point it, when you go when 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 a group experiences downward mobility they blame it, somebody. They're, no, their their situation that's not supposed to happen in America. Very few groups have seen this. Very few groups have actually been going like this and then like that. Now there are people who are stagnant and there are people who move up, but 
this downward mobility is even more traumatic when other people are going up. So the white working class is looking around and seeing that we've seen enormous American prosperity. I mean, when I came to America, the Dow Jones Industrial Average was, I don't even remember what it was, but it was in the hundreds. Okay, but hold, 20, see, well, see, but here's right there, but here's right there. And this, okay. and this is the thing, and those white working class folks should realize, the Dow not about them. First of all, half of America doesn't even invest in the stock market. Okay, that is not about them. Okay, it's not even close to it. I, I'm using but, the but, stock market as simply a metaphor but no, 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 for, because but the, but it, it represents but the, all the companies. No, so it no, 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 no. The state but, of the economy. But, but, but the problem with that is not your investment in the stock no, market. No, but, it, but the problem with that is that we go, oh, see, we're doing better. No, no, no. They are doing better. You're not doing better. When you look at what has happened in this country, we saw with the carrier workers. Trump came in. I'm gonna save your jobs. Okay, they gave him some quick tax credits. That lasted six months. And Kerry said, we're out of here. Automation is what is killing him. The issue that we're having with many of these people who are living in the middle parts of the country, where it's 90 plus percent white, okay, they actually think we're going to go back to old America. They think, oh, yeah, that one company is going to come back. It's going to supply this entire town with jobs. Yeah. It's going to feed the general store and the restaurants and the coffee shop. That ain't happening. And they're sitting there going, oh, but Trump told me it's going to happen. It ain't happening. Well, When's the last time you went to a bank? Well, I, I, go, to the, I go to the bank. Okay. I, I haven't walked to the bank in I don't know how long. I know. Do you know. How many jobs have we lost because of that? Look, because of technology? How many jobs have we lost because of automation? You have immigration. You have globalization, which is to say free trade. And you have technology. And that's a perfect storm. You have three gale force winds that have been blowing against, wiping out whole industries. And the Chamber you know. of Commerce that loves the Republican Party, they don't mind globalization. Yeah, but they he, don't but, mind trade. They love, they, they, they and have. Wouldn't, and wouldn't you agree that the Democratic Party has not offered a serious alternative on any of these three. On what? Globalization, what's their solution? Here's the deal. Trade. You have two, you have two parties. Let me go back to this. So until Trump started addressing all those three issues, Trump addresses globalization, he addresses immigration, he addresses trade. So if you're a working class guy, I agree, you're not going to get the country store back. But if you want one guy in the entire landscape of American politics who's actually talking about the three things that have wiped out your job, in a sense, destroyed your community, undermined even the, the cohesive bonds of family. And if there's one guy who at least seems to understand, it's Donald J. Trump. So why do those people then still hold racial animosity against black people? I think, unfortunately, I, well, some of the blame I lay at the feet of Obama. Because, How? Because, because I think that Obama used in an Alinskyite way, racial polarization as a tactic. How? Uh, Give me an example. Well, uh, whether in, in Obama's case, there was no ever a direct attempt to address these pro African Americans. You know, I never saw Obama in the inner city. I never saw him actually talking about, about those issues. But what he would do is he would look for incidents, the Ferguson okay, riots, for hold example, on, hold on, hold were really good. Before you go there, you say, I didn't see him in these inner cities. You do know he's a black man, right? I, I'm not and, saying and he never... No, 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 no. Let me yep. walk you through it. I do know You do know he's a black man. man. I do. And you do know, being the first black president, you had white resentment as to, uh-oh, I don't... Okay, let me speak to you. I'm going I'm to I'm talk to you as a, being a black man. When you're a black man in a white America, what happens is there's a, there's a duality that exists. There's a, there's a game that you have to play. You've got to talk a certain way, dress a certain way, act a certain way. And what happens is the things that you do in order to move forward in this society, to appease mainstream, is to operate in a certain way. So I can't talk about certain things. I can't address certain things. I can't go certain places. I'm telling you, I spent six years at CNN. It was the same thing. That would be, it was like, oh, no, you shouldn't say that. Um, you know what, you should sort of dress this way because that'll well, be let me ask you this. Do you Oh, no, think no, no, but I'm, I'm following me. For Obama, his whole deal was, and he said it, he said, I can't, I disagree with him, but he said, I can't do specific things for black people because then I'm going to get accused of, oh, you're helping the blacks. One year into his term, one year in, i never forget, CBS did a poll and 20, it was on the Tea Party, and 25% of the Tea Party people said Obama is doing too much for black people. 
I saw that poll and I busted out laughing because it was hilarious. And I'm going, show me, please. Obama understood that if I do what you talked about, oh, I'm going to get nailed in white America. So you know what? I got to talk. I got to be about race neutral. I got to speak about policies well, that lift all boats. That that was a language that he used. I understand what you're saying. And That's I, what I, happened. Look, I, I agree that with regard to issues like affirmative action, Obama was had to tread carefully because he had no, to show... No, 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 oh, not no, no, affirmative no, no, action. No, 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 let me, let, let, me, let me say what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that the areas that, are, that have the deepest urban blight are under the control of the Democratic Party. They're, the mayors are Democratic, the offic city officials... Who are the governors? Oh, the governors are Democratic. The, no, governors, the, governors the governors of the whole state. But I'm just yeah, saying... Yeah, but these, also but the governor's still over that area? The governor oversees the whole state, I agree. If, but if, I'm just you, saying you there's say, a you whole... Say Whole, there's a whole educational establishment. But, but, you, can't, a, but you can't. See, again, no, see, here's what I'm saying. Ask, Obama you, had. Uh, you, you, go ahead. Well, all I'm trying to say is if somebody wanted to create uh, an entrepreneurial revival in inner cities that's not targeted to blacks, it's aimed at, at improving our cities. Our city life is terrible in this Please, country. Okay, so, Dibinesh, how do you then completely ignore when Obama was trying to present that level of agenda? That got blocked by Republicans because Obama had a Obama had an anti-business gene that he seems to have. We we don't need to debate this, but he he had an, an, uh, uh, an he had a resistance to entrepreneurial capitalism. No, he, he didn't. didn't. Yes, he did. Yes, no, he, he did. didn't. Yes, he did. He I did. mean, see, here's the deal: you can't you can't have it both ways. You can't present this argument that, well, Obama didn't do this, and we're going to blame him for it, and then, as if Republicans were sitting there going, you know what, we were more than welcome this legislation. They weren't. Their deal was, we're not going to pass anything that you actually want. And when you talk about still blaming Obama, that's just nonsensical. What you had here was, you had these incidents that were happening across the country, and there were people who, who okay, we don't want you to address them. Even when he addressed the issue with Skip Gates in Cambridge, it's as if Sean Hannity never even heard what he said. They said, oh, he called the cops stupid. No, he didn't. What he said is they acted stupidly in arresting him after it was determined he lived there. That's what he said. I listened to it multiple times. But they took that as saying, oh, Obama hates cops. He called them stupid. It was a lie. What he was saying is, yes, it was stupid to arrest the man after you've already established that was his house. And every black person who was watching it going, yeah, no kidding. Hell, I live there. Why in the hell would you arrest the guy and that's his house? But Obama gets criticized for that. His white advisors come in. Hey, we got to downplay this. We got to knock this thing down because, you know, you stepped in it. Obama said, hell, I'm not sitting there walking that thing back. Get the hell out of the Oval Office. Then they go back. No, he's got to walk it back. Two, three days go by. It's all on conservative radio. It's all on Fox News. Now we got to have the beer summit. That point right there, Obama gets gun shy on the issue of race because how he was attacked for a comment he never made. So what you may be saying if, you know, I, I, what, what I think is very interesting about this conversation is you, you have, here we are, you know, the two of us. We are clearly living in two different moral universes because you just described living this dual life. And of course, I know about it. I've read W.B. Du Bois, I, you know, Richard Wright. I gotta I know, live I, it. I know it, I know it. I don't live it. And I'm, I have to ask myself a little bit, are you, are you describing, describing an experience that is unique to African Americans in this country that applies to no one else? Actually, I, 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 no, I, I, no, 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 the answer is yes. The answer, no, the answer is, is yes. yes. Okay. Because, because the reality is no other group has the history, has the ingrained history that we do. No other group. There's no. Correct. I agree. And, so, and that's part of the issue. So, for instance, when so Republicans take control of the House and the Senate, they're debating on the floor of the House, and the, the Republicans want to get rid of an Obama era law that targeted discrimination in auto lending. Their argument oh, this is hurting business. Black folks are going, no, it's hurting us because the data was there. The data showed that when somebody black came in, they were offering them higher interest rates uh, when it came to vehicles than somebody who was non-black. What do Republicans do? Let's get rid of it. And Maxine Waters is on the floor arguing with the, with the Republican on it, and that's the example I'm talking about. How simple is something such as anti-discrimination rules meant to target auto lenders so they're not discriminating against black people, forcing them to pay more, and what the, one of the first things Republicans do when Trump gets in, we're going to get rid of that law. 
and I'm sitting there going, Republican, this is why black folks won't vote for you. And it's, 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 and so we talk about this whole duality. Here's the deal. There is no black man on television who could act like Sean Hannity or Bill O'Reilly or any one of them. Not one. Not one. You know why? Because, no, no, we, we have to act a certain way, talk a certain way, walk a certain way, because what we have to do is we have to make white folks feel comfortable with us being in their presence. We have to change who we are. I worked at CNN. I had a white booker, white female booker, who was yelling at me about a segment I did. And my natural instinct was to cuss her the hell out. But, you know, I can't do that. I'm a black man. That's a white woman. That's, that's the world that we live in. And what no, I'm saying no. is we have to understand how this still operates. We, just, we run the videos on my show all the time of some white woman calling the cops on a black person selling lemonade. On, the other day, this woman called the cops on a black man because she said his car was two inches in the crosswalk. Stuff happens to black people that don't happen to other folks, Dinesh. No, look, and, and so here's the point. <laughs> and it's, so imagine being black, and that's what you've got to deal with every day, that the level of silliness that exists just walking, barbecuing, selling lemonade, just being black. And you try to be an entrepreneur, but damn, you're going to call the cops on me well, because I'm selling lemonade, and you ask me, I don't have a permit. Well, I will tell you that, look. It don't happen to white kids. Yeah, I've, look, I have been in the precincts of the conservative Republican Party for 30 years. These kinds of, of complaints that you're making, I assure you, would get a very sympathetic hearing among any Republican group I know. The caricature that these are white nationalist Ku Klux Klan's guys, nonsense. That's not true. I'm not saying that there isn't a constant political rivalry between the parties. I'm not saying that the two parties do whatever they can to undermine the other party's prospects. But I am saying this, that... If you're making arguments that fit within, I would call it, the colorblind principle. The colorblind principle basically means the same rules apply across the board. If a white guy wants to get certain terms to get a car, a black guy should have the same terms. I'm saying that that colorblind principle is, in principle, as far as I can see, it has no resistance on the Republican side. Now, so, here's so the, why? Because okay, I'll tell you why. So why did they get rid of the law? Why? Because, they, because in some of these cases, the Republican suspicion, and I, we can debate the individual case, is that, is that the law is actually trying to do something else other than enforce a clear color no. principle. See, Dinesh, Dinesh, uh, look, Dinesh, Republicans Dinesh, are not against... Dinesh, Dinesh, here's the deal, though. The data is clear. They have That's, the data. It's there. Well, I've seen, it's the, there. I've seen the data on bank lending. I haven't seen the data oh, on I'm, automobiles. I'm, I'm, oh, look, I'm to, look, I can tell you right now, as a black man, when me and my former wife went to go buy a house, you know what, the, you know what they asked for? They saw our income, and they said, um, can y'all bring in deposit slips? I said, hell no. There's nothing here that says I have to bring in deposit slips to prove my income. That says direct deposit. Deposit slips. I'm telling you what this experience is like. And what I'm saying is, well, that's why I kept saying technically fully free. There was a black woman who sued uh, the, the VA in Virginia. Credentials, perfect, you name it. She goes in, applies for the job, all the education. And they went, when the interview was over, oh, we don't like her cornrows. They didn't like her cornrows. She sues. She wins. Taxpayers got to foot that bill because of that. And I'm, that's, that is a part of the black experience in America. And what I'm saying is, you said it would get a sympathetic ear from Republicans. Yeah. What, what Republicans, but, but you're going to have to prove it, because I'm telling you right now, there was, a group of, there was a group of black Republicans in Illinois when I lived there. They had a meeting with the Republican Party of Illinois, and they came up with their charts and everything showing what we can do when it comes to trying to get black votes. Great presentation. This is the first question when they got done. Guys, we are not going to support welfare. The black Republicans went, who the hell even brought up welfare? That literally was the first thing they said. And what I'm saying to you is that as long as Republicans don't sit down with black people, don't talk to black people, don't communicate with black people, don't do black media, they, they will never get black votes and they will never understand. And that and their resistance to that 
leads to black folks saying, we want no part of you because you won't even talk to us. And I am living proof. And the last example I'll give you, Mitch McConnell, when his book came out, Strauss Media was booking his radio tour. They booked him on the Tom Jordan Morning Show. Largest urban morning show in America, 8 million listeners. They were like, ah, they called back, uh, Roland's going to be doing the interview? Yes, he did the interview. Uh, what is he going to ask them? What are you going to ask him about the damn book? And obviously, the news of the day. Um, no, we're going to go ahead and cancel. Why are you afraid to come on a show with 8 million? Because you're afraid to actually get asked a couple of fair and tough questions? He was a majority leader. I frankly don't, it's, it's nonsensical. I don't, it makes no sense to me because I think that, I think that the, look, the, the Republican philosophy today is exactly the same as it was in Lincoln's day. It's the philosophy of the self-made man. It's the philosophy of a guy who starts at the bottom. Well, they sure don't act like it. No, they do act like it. But what you're saying is that they are inattentive to a unique experience of African Americans that's not, because look, the Republican message gets through to a lot of people. You're just saying that blacks are a special case. Now I'm saying if, if no, you no, have no, a special no, case. No, what I'm, what I'm telling you is when I look at that, when I see that the North Carolina Republican Party specifically targeted black people when it came to voting, that's, and, it, and they have the proof, it's sitting right there. What I'm telling you is when Republican, when I, I am living proof. I have had the only national television show that speaks to African Americans for the last nine years. Three white, Repu three white Republicans, one Latino Republican, only because he's a Texas A&M graduate, Bill Flores, and, and, uh, and then the black Republicans come on. Senator Tim Scott came on. Michael Steele came on. Ben Carson came on. I've interviewed every major black Republican in the last 25 years. White Republicans will not come on and you got to ask yourself why why will the black republicans come on and not the white republicans why and that's the gop's problem well it is the gop's problem and i think that um i'd like to see trump address it more frontally i'd yeah. like to see and him still waiting on him yeah, but I think you have a better chance with him than you might have had with a lot of well, other guys who may seem more close to you they, ideologically. They get an invitation, they get an email every single month from me to do have that sit down, and they have yet to even schedule it, and most of the time don't even respond. We'll see. We'll see. Zanash D'Souza, appreciate it. Thanks a bunch. My pleasure. There's only one daily digital show out here that keeps it black and keep it real as Roland Martin Unfiltered. Because guess what? We come back live January 3rd. The blackest show on all of digital, cable, and broadcast. See that name right there? Roland Martin Unfiltered. Hello. Y'all want some of this? YouTube.com forward slash Roland S. Martin. And don't forget to turn on your notifications. There's only one show out here folks, in the digital world that's focused on you. Because here's the piece. I ain't afraid of Fox News. Come back live January 3rd. You want to support Roller March Unfiltered? Be sure to join our Bring the Funk fan club. Every dollar that you give to us supports our daily digital show. There's only one daily digital show out here that keeps it black and keep it real as Roller Martin Unfiltered. Support the Roller Martin Unfiltered daily digital show by going to RollerMartinUnfiltered.com. Our goal is to get 20,000 of our fans contributing 50 bucks each for the whole year. You can make this possible. RollerMartinUnfiltered.com. That's it for this special edition of Roland Martin Unfiltered, The Great Debate, Roland Martin and Dinesh D'Souza.